Modern scholarship on this subject really began in 1955 with the publication of a book entitled Homosexuality in the Western Christian Tradition by Dr. Derek Sherwin Bailey. But we're going to step back from that uh, just a little bit. We'll come back to it in a minute. But let's go back to 1910 to the publication of a commentary on the book of Genesis by Dr. Herman Gunkel. Because Dr. Gunkel is recognized as a genius when it comes to interpreting Hebrew scripture, he is a perfect example of how prejudice controlled the interpretation of many of these passages up until Bailey's work in 1955. So when Gunkel reaches Genesis 19, which as you know is the story about the destruction of the city of Sodom, what we experience in his commentary is just this total lapse in all of his previously demonstrated exegetical, interpretive, biblical skills. And a perfect example of how easy it is for people to bring all of their stereotypes and their presuppositions into these passages. Gunkel wrote at a time when homosexuality, especially in academic circles, was still understood primarily in terms of the Greek concept of pederastia or pederasty. You're familiar with this concept. It is the idea of the sexual attraction of adult males for young boys. Now, the word homosexuality had entered into his German vocabulary in the 1890s in the writings of Richard von Kraft Ebbing, but particularly in theological schools, in theological books, theological dialogues, they continued exclusively to use the German word Nabenleba, which literally means boy love. So when Gunkel is interpreting the book of Genesis and he gets to chapter 19, he in essence has two things before him. He has his presupposition that this story is about homosexuality and his belief that homosexuality is about the sexual abuse of children by adults. And on the other hand, he has the text. So let's begin just by reading the text. I invite you to just listen. Try to listen to this as if you've never heard it before. Try to listen for the details in this story. I'll be reading Genesis 19, uh, verses 1 through 11. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. He said, Please, my lords, Turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you can go get up early and go on your way. By the way, this, the beginning of this passage where it says these were angels, this is a, a technical term of, which is theophany. It is the idea of divine beings who appear in human form. So while for the purposes of this story in scripture, these were divine beings, so far as Lot or anyone else, else was concerned, these were just human beings. They appeared to them uh, just to be human beings. They said, no, we will spend the night in the square. But he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, surrounded the house, and they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may know them. Lot went out the door to the men, shut the door behind him, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Look, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Let me bring them out to you and do with them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they replied, stand back. And they said, this fellow came here as an alien, and now he would play the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to the door to break it down. But the men inside reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the door of the house, both small and great, so that they were unable to find the door. Now, it probably will not surprise you which of those influences, his presupposition for that text we just heard, was the more influential to Dr. Gunkel when he came to interpret these passages. He read what you and I just read and decided that that was a story about child rape. This is what he writes, quote, This ancient saga views the crime of child rape as something completely atrocious. Such a city deserves fire and brimstone. The men are represented as youths. 
in the bloom of their youth, whose fresh beauty excites the evil lust of the sodomites, close quote. Did you hear any of that? In those verses we just read, of course you didn't. It's not there, not even by the wildest stretch of the imagination. But that's not the point, is it? The point is that even some of the world's best biblical scholars and interpreters cannot resist the temptation to bring their own prejudices to these verses that we're going to be talking about tonight. So let's approach these verses to the best of our ability, trying to learn from them whatever we can on the ground just of sound biblical scholarship. D.S. Bailey's book, again published in 1955, Homosexuality in the Western Christian Tradition, is almost exclusively about that story from Genesis 19, which is about the destruction of Sodom. Bailey points out that whatever that story is about, the meaning of it revolves around the translation of one Hebrew word. The Hebrew word is Yad Ha, which is translated to know, send them out that we may know them. Bailey points out that this word is used 943 other times in Hebrew scripture. Ten of those 943 times it has a sexual connotation and in every one of those instances it is clearly heterosexual. The other 933 times the word simply means to get acquainted with. And so Bailey begins by saying we should translate this word to mean send them out so that we may find out who these people are, so that we may get acquainted with them. And there is actually good reason for believing that because Sodom was one of a number of cities which were always at war with each other. Remember, these were ancient walled cities. And people were very suspicious of strangers because anybody who came into your city might be a spy. They might be somebody casing the joint, trying to figure out how to mount an attack against your city. So they were very suspicious of... How many of you grew up in really small towns? Yeah, me too. Remember how suspicious you were of strangers? In, in the little town I grew up in in Mississippi, I mean, nobody moved there. I mean, there wasn't any reason to move there. But when I was 12 years old in the sixth grade, lo and behold, a family moved there. And they had a little boy who was in my class. I'll never forget his name was Benny Benteen. And my parents sat me down, and I remember them saying to me, now don't make friends with him until we find out what his father does and which church they're going to go to. These people were equally suspicious of strangers, and because of that, the citizens in the city had different levels of privilege as regards citizenship. For example, if you were born in that city, if you were a native of the city of Sodom, then it was assumed that your allegiance certainly belonged there. But remember in that story it says that Lot was a resident alien? They said, this man wasn't born here, he came here. Lot had a status, which in Hebrew is called the status of the ger, the resident alien. And resident aliens' privileges as citizens were limited. There were certain things they could do, certain things they could not do. One of the things they could not do was bring a stranger into the city without their credentials first being checked to find out whether or not they might be spies. So Bailey begins by saying, the word yet high here is appropriately translated as send them out so that we can find out who these people are. And so he says the real sin of Sodom was a violation of the ancient code of hospitality which the city refused to show to these strangers. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But first of all, it's impossible really to understand the story in Genesis 19 without first understanding a similar story in the 19th chapter of the book of Judges. Let me give you a little background. This is a story about a man. He was, uh, he was an Israelite. He was uh, a Levite, the tribe of Levi, and he lived in the hill country of Ephraim, and he married a woman who was from Bethlehem in Judea, and they had a, a, a fight. They had a quarrel, and uh, she went home to daddy. She went back home to Bethlehem. And he waited four months for her to come back. And when she didn't come back, he packed up two donkeys and took one of his servants and went to Bethlehem to try to convince her to come home with him. They got there. They sat down. They negotiated. The father-in-law helped them talk through their problems. 
and finally she agreed to go back home with him. And this incident that we're about to read uh, actually happened on their return trip back to the hill country of Ephraim. If you will listen to this story again, listen very closely for the t details, specifically the similarity between this story and the story we just heard. He got up and departed and arrived opposite Jebus, that's a, an ancient name for Jerusalem. He had with him a couple of saddled donkeys and his wife was with him. And when they were near Jebus, the day was far spent and the servant said to his master, come now let us turn aside to the city of the Jebusites and spend the night. But his master said to him, we will not turn aside into a city of foreigners who do not belong to the people of Israel. Jerusalem was not even an Israelite city yet. That's how ancient this story is. But we will continue on to Gibeah. Then he said to his servant, come let us try to reach one of these places and spend the night at Gibeah or at Ramah. So they passed on and went their way, and the sun went down on the near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. They turned aside there to go in and spend the night at Gibeah. He went in and sat down in the open square of the city, but no one took him in to spend the night. Then at evening there was an old man coming from his work in the field. This man was from the hill country of Ephraim, and he was residing into Gibeah. When the old man looked up and saw the wayfarer in the open square of the city, he said, Where are you going and where you come from? He answered him, We are passing from Bethlehem in Judea to the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim from which I come. I went to Bethlehem in Judea, now I am going home, but nobody has offered to take me in. We, your servants, have straw and fodder for our donkeys, with bread and wine for me and the woman and the young man along with us. We do not need anything more. The old man said, Peace be to you. I will care for all of your wants, only do not spend the night in the square. So he brought him into his house and fed the donkeys, and they washed their feet and ate and drank. While they were enjoying themselves, the men of the city, a perverse lot, surrounded the house and started pounding on the door. They said to the old man, the master of the house, Bring out the man who came into your house so that we may know him. And the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, no, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Since the man is my guest, do not do this vile thing. Here are my virgin daughter and his wife. Let me bring them out now. Ravish them and do whatever you want to them. But against this man, do not do this vile thing. But the men would not listen to him. So the man seized his wife and put her out to them. They wantonly raped her and abused her all through the night until the morning. And as the dawn began to break, they let her go. As morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her husband was until it was light. In the morning, her husband got up and opened the door of the house. And when he went out to go on his way, there was his wife lying at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. Get up, he said, we are going. But there was no answer. She was dead. Then he put her on his donkey and the man set out for his home. When he had entered his house, he took a knife, and grasping his wife, he cut her into twelve pieces, limb by limb, and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. Now, scholars agree that that story was modeled on, if, not, if it did not come directly from the same core story as the story in the 19th chapter of Genesis about the destruction of Sodom. As a matter of fact, there was an oral tradition in that part of the world um, this, uh, very similar stories were found in lots of extra-biblical literature as well. The, the core of the story was always the same, but then there were always just a, a few details changed. The core of the story was that a stranger comes to a city. The people of the city refuse to offer hospitality. A resident alien of the city offers these strangers hospitality, takes them into their home, then the people of the city rise up against the visitors. There's an act of violence, and then there is an act of divine retribution against that violence. That's the core story which appeared uh, numerous times in that part of the world. Now, even though in this story the men of the city say exactly the same words that are supposed to make the story in Genesis conclusively about homosexuality, send them out that we may know them, both Christians and Jews have unanimously failed ever to interpret this story as ever having anything to do with homosexuality. Instead, it has always been seen as a story about the moral imperative of offering hospitality to strangers. A lot of different reasons have been given as to why later tradition gave one meaning to one of these stories and a totally different meaning to the other story. Probably the most feasible one is that in the Sodom story, the aggressors were Canaanites. 
They were Gentiles, they were not Israelites. However, in the Gibeah story, these were Benjaminites. These were people of the tribe of Benjamin, these were Israelites. And so as the, the Hebrew people themselves started creating the, their, their traditions around these stories, it was just probably a lot easier for them you know, to attribute these, this act to the foreigners instead of to themselves. Now, I would argue that in spite of Bailey's very tightly woven and convincing argument that the real topic of this story is hospitality, that there is evidence that specific kinds of homosexual acts may be at issue in both of these stories. First of all, because Bailey's argument that the word to know does not have a sexual meaning when it refers to the men in verse 5, but it clearly does have a sexual meaning in verse 8 when he's talking about his daughters, well, that's just not a very convincing argument because the meaning of words is not determined by their numerical frequency, but by the context in which we find them. Secondly, Bailey suggests that when Lot offered his daughters to the mob, that wasn't really a sexual offer. That was just the best diversion he could come up with at the moment. That's not particularly convincing either. And numerous people, of course, have pointed out that if it was a sexual offer, uh, it would have been futile anyway if all the men of the city were homosexuals gathered around um, and trying to get to the men in the house. Third of all, in the book of Judges, there are several expressions which seem to reinforce the idea that homosexual acts may have been a possibility here. Particularly the word that is translated outrage in verse 24 has a sexual meaning most of the time in Hebrew scripture. So, if as it as seems certain to me, we're not talking here about mobs of homosexual men surrounding these houses, then where does the possibility of homosexuality enter these two stories? This is very important. Homosexuality doesn't. Specific kinds of homosexual acts might. Kenneth Dover writes in his book, Greek Homosexuality, quote, human societies at many times and in many regions have subjugated strangers, newcomers, and trespassers to homosexual anal violation as a way of reminding them of their subordinate status, close quote. Bishop John Spong writes, quote, a popular way to insult the stranger was to force him to take the feminine role in the sex act. Nothing was more insulting to a man than to be treated like a woman. So an alien who was made to act out a woman's role in sexual activity would receive the ultimate power insult that the male citizens of the city could administer." Close quote. So both passages make it unquestionably clear that if to know has a sexual meaning here, it is rape. And rape is not sex. Rape is sexualized violence. And so we certainly have the right to ask why it should not be easily understood that homosexual persons would no more approve of what might have happened at Sodom then heterosexual persons would approve of what actually did happen at Gibeah. Now, continuing the argument that homosexuality is not the subject of Genesis 19, Bailey emphasizes a very important principle of biblical interpretation. And it simply says, let the Bible interpret itself. The Bible is wonderfully consistent on all really important issues. Let the Bible interpret itself. Did you know that the prophet Ezekiel, in chapter 16, beginning with verse 40, lists specifically why the city of Sodom was destroyed? And he says it was because of pride and because they refused to take care of the needy and the poor in their midst. Did you know that the prophet Isaiah, in chapter 3, verse 9, says specifically why the city of Sodom was destroyed? And he says it was a lack of justice. Did you know that the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 23, verse 14, lists specifically why the city of Sodom was destroyed? And he says it was the heterosexual sin of adultery. Did you know that in the deuterocanonical books that we call the Apocrypha, which you Catholics are a lot more familiar with than, the, than us Protestants, in the book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 16, verse 8, it says Sodom was destroyed because of pride. In the book of Wisdom, chapter 19, verses 13 and 14, it says Sodom was destroyed because of inhospitality. Did you know that in both the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells us specifically why the city of Sodom was destroyed? In both of those Gospels. Let me read to you Matthew 10, 
beginning with verse 9. This is the story of Jesus sending his disciples out into the world for the very first time. Chapter 10, uh, beginning with verse 9. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town you enter, find out who is in it, who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is, house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you into their home, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that town. Now, in addition to the Bible interpreting itself and telling us why Sodom was destroyed, Bailey also points out that it was not until centuries after the book of Genesis was written that tradition ever attached any sexual implication to the sin of Sodom. The first time we read of any sexual reference to the sin of Sodom is in a document called the Palestinian Pseudepigrapha, which was not written until between the first century BC and the first century AD. The first time a homosexual reference ever appears in terms of the reason for the destruction of Sodom is not until the second century AD, centuries after this story was written. And it appears in a document called the Book of Jubilees. Dr. John Boswell, in his book, Christianity, Social Tolerance, and Homosexuality, points out further that all of the early Christian writers commented on this story, and yet not one of them attaches any sexual implication to the sin of Sodom. For example, Origen, who was one of the, the, the patriarchs, one of the, the fathers of the church. Origen, if anybody was going to do it, it would have been Origen. Because Origen was notoriously ascetic himself. He castrated himself and he recommended that all Christian men castrate themselves as a way of avoiding sexual temptation. This is what he wrote in his commentary on this story. Quote, Hear this, you who close your homes to guests. Hear this, you who shun the traveler as an enemy. Lot lived among the Sodomites. We do not read of any other good deed of his. He escaped the flames. He escaped the fire on account of one thing only. He opened his home to guests. The angels entered the hospitable household. The flames entered the homes that were closed to guests. Close quote. It is very important for us to just stop here for just a minute and pause and realize that Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all list specific causes for the destruction of Sodom, but homosexuality is not one of them. The early church fathers, like Origen, wrote extensively on why Sodom was destroyed, they never said homosexuality was a reason. And yet they were referring to exactly the same words which so many people insist today must be about homosexuality. Every serious student of the Bible knows that those earlier, more primary sources have to be taken more seriously simply because they were more intimately familiar with the language and the customs and the cultures of the people involved. Now, let's, let's wrap this one up by looking at what Bailey concludes are the two real issues in this story. If this story is not about homosexuality, what is it about? He says, first of all, it is about the sacredness of the guest, hospitality. Now, it may be a little difficult for us to understand why that was so important in the ancient world. After all, it's not that big a deal to us. If you and I decide to go somewhere, we gas up our vehicles, we jump in them, and we take off. We know that if we get tired, there'll be a motel. We can stop and rest. If we get hungry, there'll be a restaurant. If the car runs out of gas, there'll be a place to get more fuel. But it was not like that in the ancient world. There were several reasons why hospitality was a very different issue then than now. One of them was that your life depended upon it. If you set out on a journey in that land, you were on foot, and if you could not depend upon the hospitality of strangers for food and water and shelter, you would not survive your journey. 
Secondly, because the Hebrews had not been extended hospitality in Egypt or when they came out of Egypt, they were commanded by God always to show hospitality to other people. Uh, Exodus 22, 21 says, You shall not wrong or oppress a resident alien, for remember, you were aliens in the land of Egypt. Leviticus 19.34 says, The alien who resides with you shall be as a citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. It's easy for us to miss the sin of Sodom because our culture is definitely more preoccupied with sexual issues than with issues of hospitality. But it was not so in the ancient world. Go, sometime read, go back and read the the whole sixth chapter of the book of Joshua. It makes it clear that they had a different priority back then. This is the story we all learned in Sunday school about Joshua at the Battle of Jericho and the walls come tumbling down. In that story, again, an entire city is destroyed because of a lack of hospitality. And that is judged as more serious than a sexual sin. The whole city is destroyed except for one person. The one person who is spared is the prostitute, Rahab. Even though her lifestyle as a prostitute is condemned in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, she is spared for one reason, it says, because she extended hospitality to the messengers of Joshua. Now that's also not the last time we hear about Rahab. Rahab appears again, doesn't she? In the first chapter of the book of Matthew, verse 5, the genealogy of Jesus Rahab, the prostitute, is the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus. She was spared in that story because she extended hospitality. Now, the first real issue in the story is hospitality in the ancient world. What is the second one? It is what Bailey calls the sacredness of the male gender in the ancient world. Dr. George Edwards' term for this patriarchal influence is considerably less kind than the sacredness of the male gender. He calls it phallic aggression. And he writes, quote, I would further argue that the eclipsing of phallic aggression, that is the sexual violence that did occur in the exegesis of Genesis 19 and Judges 19, serves the subtle purpose of shifting the horrific guilt in these stories from the account of masculinity run amok to homosexuality, close quote. Thorkel Vanguard in his book, Phallus, a symbol and its history in the male world, writes, quote, the aggressive element, devoid of eroticism, is precisely what is operating in such scenes of collective violence as that described in the biblical story of Sodom, close quote. The point for us is there are elements in both Genesis 19 and Judges 19 which are antithetical to the ethic of love and justice that is the very heart of prophetic faith and Christian freedom. And it's not about homosexuality or homosexuals. It may be about disvaluing female children and women. I have heard people practically hysterical in their insistence that this story is about homosexuality and the fact that God destroyed Sodom is proof that homosexuals are going to cause the end of the family and democracy and civilization as we know it. But I have never heard one of them mention that Lot was willing to sacrifice his own two virgin daughters to this mob to save the lives of these two male strangers, or what the implications of that might be for the epidemic of child sexual abuse in this country, and who we know statistically is doing it. Pediatrics Magazine, which is the journal of the pediatric medical profession, did a longitudinal study of sexual abuse in this country, and one of their conclusions was that children are more than 100 times more likely to be sexually abused by a heterosexual male than a homosexual. Why don't we hear that when people are preaching from this scripture? I believe that Bailey's major argument that the sin of Sodom was inhospitality towards strangers is correct. That clearly is the way Jesus interpreted it. 
But I don't think we can ignore the possibility that sexualized violence might have been an issue here as well. But if that is true, it is rape. And it can no more be considered a condemnation of homosexuality and homosexual persons than the heterosexual rape that happened at Gibeah can be considered a condemnation of heterosexuality and heterosexual persons. Father John McNeil writes in his book, The Church and the Homosexual, quote, if this interpretation of the sin of Sodom is correct, then we are dealing here with one of the supremely ironic paradoxes of history. For thousands of years in the Christian West, homosexuals have been the victims of inhospitable treatment. Condemned by the church, they have been the victims of persecution, torture, and death. In the name of a mistaken understanding of the crime of Sodom, the true crime has been and continues to be repeated every day.